Namo Buddha. Death. The only one sure thing there is, is death. There is birth, aging, sickness and death. The nature of life is we will get old, we'll get sick and die. Not necessarily is it the case, however, we even reach a ripe old age and pass away, die graciously. You can expect death at any moment. Now the process of death contemplation in a monastic uh, practice is to bring ourselves closer to that realization of the fragility of life and the inevitability of death. Life is uncertain, death is certain. So hence in the Thai forest tradition there are practices which involve coming close to uh, the dying for their own comfort, peace of mind, uh, for religious purposes, but it is, it is also useful for the monk or nun's uh, mental uh, development to come close to what is our own uh, fate, our own uh, certainty, our own death. The question arises when there's sudden, unexpected, early deaths. If you look at the leaves from the tree, uh, I sweep a lot of leaves here, uh, you'll see all colours from the crinkly old brown to the lighter brown, reds, greens, lighter greens and even the little yellow, new leaves that fall from the tree all falling as nature has it. Leaves that have grown old on the tree and leaves that have literally just sprung into life, still yellow, having not had many days sun to develop the green yet. Laying there on the floor, <coughs> finished with, dead. This is the same in human nature, in human life, unexpected child deaths, adolescents, young people, middle-aged and older. It happens. If we look at East and West, we say the West and we say the East. We don't really sort of say the East. We look at Asia as an area and consider in Asia Western society. Um, I suppose to some extent in Western society we hide a little bit away from death. We hide a little bit away from old age. We hide a little bit away from sickness. Palliative care is often in a place outside of the home. More so these days it's brought into the home, which is a wonderful and good thing. But traditionally it's been in a different location by professionals. Very good, very successful but of course not really right in front of you are you seeing the dying. Uh, we don't talk about death. People use the term he passed, passing away. Um, the uh, many other things people say rather than he died, he's dead. There is death. <laughs> um, to some extent we're a little shy. Uh, in Asia it's a little bit more visual, uh, often uh, dying is, well more often than not dying is done in the home amongst with the family uh, in close proximity, palliative care would be in the home and uh, in India it's very much a, a, a big uh, procession through the town when a body, uh, when someone has died to take their body through the town on bamboo uh, stretchers, uh, stretcher and 
song and dance and parade the body around the town circumambulate a few times before going to the funeral pyre, the fire, the incinerator, the cremation ground. Um, very public and not in a closed wooden box. Of course in some other Christian religions and Catholic we have the open caskets for observation but it's still a little bit something we don't want to talk about and this is a lot of the problem towards with dealing with and understanding uh, death and accepting grief as part of the process. process. So <clears throat> what is death? Well were you dead before you were born? You hadn't existed. Are you um, what is going to happen after you die? Now these are questions we cannot know the answers to. We can only know the experience of what happens in this moment as it is because everything else is in the past is just memory and memories are unreliable and everything else that's happening in the future is just imagination which is of course equally if not more so unreliable. What are we whilst we're alive? I mean we're physically this uh, bunch of elements held together by quite what we're not sure um, well I'm certainly not sure quantum physics will tell you that uh, if you go down to below molecular, molecular level and atomic level we're mainly space with little tennis balls if you like all buzzing around and held together by something um, and Again, we cannot spend our lives pondering on the concept of what brought this to be because this would not bring about the end of suffering in this lifetime. Whereas the understanding of the Buddha's teachings, the Four Noble Truths and the uh, Noble Eightfold Path leading to the development of wisdom and then the understanding of the characteristics of life um, existence does lead us to some understanding and ultimately a full knowledge of that nature which is that everything is impermanent it is unsatisfactory and not within our control now take this body for instance your body any body we can see I think something like every seven years each and every cell in that body is replaced so this, uh, uh, to all intents and purposes, person you see in front of you here, seven years ago, I would have been in this country, but it wouldn't have been the same cells. Um, and it was sitting 10 kilometers up the road in a different monastery. But regardless of that, we have this idea of a person, a personality, as you have this idea of your own uh, persona, personality, being. And what is this? It is our idea of a self. We call it personality view, Sakaya Ditti. Sorry to throw in a Pali word again now. It, these Pali words sometimes mean more than personality view, the direct English translation. So I think it's good if you speak other languages to know the common Pali words and then translate it into your own mother tongue which may require a sentence, not a word, to describe the Pali word. So when I use Pali words it's not to, well it's certainly not to show off because I don't know very many, only the essential ones. I'm not an intellectual study monk, I'm a meditator really. Um, but the ones I know are the ones we need uh, to understand the teachings of the Buddha. So <clears throat> take this idea of our personality. It is made of um, causes and conditions surrounding us externally uh, and brought about internally through our own actions. Actions, if you like, is often referred to as karma and has 
other deeper connotations and meanings, but the translation of karma is actually action. So if we perform good actions, we would receive good results. If we perform bad actions, do bad things, only bad things happen. We kind of already understand this. We may not always believe it. We may see people doing bad things and getting a good existence and see people doing good things and getting a bad existence. This is an, also a situation that does a, we, we can see. But another thing not to really go deep into trying to understand is the full nature of karma. Only that, you know, when you do something good, the immediate effect of this karma is you feel good. If you do something bad, it may bring some materialistic or even sensual rewards, but ultimately you're not feeling that good about it. So we are brought about, this personality, this person, this individual, is as a result of these conditions. And what knows what this person is? Now this is where we get quite deep into the aspect of uh, self and not self. You see, in death, with regards to uh, the um, Abrahamic faiths and Christianity, for instance, we have heaven and hell, and you die, and your soul, along with these characteristics that have developed in you over the years through causes and conditions, travels to either the good place or the bad place. And maybe even some people believe in reincarnation, which would imply also that that personality also is then reincarnated in another life form. These are belief systems. In Buddhism we have no belief system, but an understanding of the truth that we can know. It doesn't mean that it, you can't believe other things. If you know and understand, that is only belief. But the truth is, uh, you die, and in Buddhist understanding, in the Buddha, teachings of the Buddha, this resulting personality, these um, aspects of what you might call a soul in other faiths, um, is no longer exposed to those supporting causes and conditions, and therefore is free, liberated, from the ties, the fetters, if you like, of life. Now, if at the point of death you're really attached to this personality view that you have of this being yourself, and all that it is, and all that it is made up from, then our understanding is the inevitability that rebirth would be likely to happen in whatever it is you're drawn towards. Uh, this is the nature of karma and rebirth, how it manifests itself. So, where it comes to meeting up with the people we've lost in future lives, this isn't something we discount, but we don't count future lives as being in a place, as going somewhere. But just coming back to death, because I don't want to talk about just the Buddhist idea of death and rebirth, I want to talk about the actual process of dying and how we understand it and ultimately hopefully accept it and then see and understand our grief as it manifests in ourselves. So if the dying person is liberated from suffering, which is our understanding, there is one consolation there. Most likely, before death, there is some degree of suffering, if not a considerable amount. And there is that liberation, that freedom, which for the survivors, the people 
whom are parted from their loved one, it has to be some consolation. You hear phrases like, he is now at peace, or she has gone to a better place. Consolations. The inevitability, um, <clears throat> if we cling to existence and don't accept that all things are impermanent, all conditioned things are impermanent, which is in the Pali word of Nietzsche. So the, uh, one of the characteristics of existence or the fundamental faculties of existence are Nietzsche. Um, this is the first and foremost thing to be really understood. From trees to buildings to mountains to universes even. But to the fragility of life, life forms, organic biological life forms, this biological life is going to break down and die after so many years or through accidental early death. The more we come to understand and accept that that is the case, the easier it is to manage and deal with when it happens. But if you're already there and you haven't been practicing this idea of, well, walking around, I'm already dead. This glass is already broken. This TV no longer works, even though those things are all okay. The inevitability is their state will not remain, entropy. These things will decay, these things will break down and no longer be or come to be in existence. This is inevitable. This is the truth, no one can argue with that. It's not a belief, it's a fact. But we still are attached, we have this tie, this fetter to our lives, to our personalities, this Sakaya Ditti, personality view, that how can that be? At least even if this body dies, this personality of mine is so outward and forthright, it's bound to go to a good place and live happily ever after in heaven. We know, perish the thought, happily ever after, an eternity in one place, even if you can have everything you want. Wouldn't that get boring at some point? So let's just look at these physical tennis balls all floating around in space and what we all are. Okay, we're these different personalities brought about by conditions. And what is it that happens when one of those personalities dies amongst a group of people whom are fond or close to love are in relationships with our family members of that person dies of course those people lament there is sorrow there is grief this displays itself in many different ways in different countries in nepal they have almost professional crying people to go to funerals who wail and scream and cry for three days in a row and things like this in in england maybe we keep a stiff upper lip wear a dark suit and little tear may roll at your father's funeral but oh, come on pull yourself together suppressing grief so two extremes there yes one society says get it all out there and one says you know come on grow up be, be sensible um the thing is you've got to do what comes naturally grief has its various stages i think there's seven or nine i didn't look it up before this i never planned these things but i've heard this and i think they're probably quite accurate they've been studied for many years because it's obviously a easy to research subject it's happening all the time um, whatever stage you're in with your grief and let me say I'm sorry for your loss if you are and I know there are people that are suffering because I've seen the comments that have come and people have lost people or emails I've received so uh, and me also, over the like, when you get to my age, people are dying all of the time. I think that's another inevitability, of course. Um, but what happens is this group of people, this society, is then left with a blank space. These uh, subatomic molecular structures, the physical nature of that person, has gone like that, dead cremated, buried, and no longer there. And then we think all we have is memories and or what it would have been with this person in the future. 
which is imagination, both inaccurate. But what there really is and what is actually present is that which remains. That which remains of that individual, that person. I mean, some people say, oh, he's always with you, he's in here, she's in here. Well, in a way, that's not too untrue because what remains is the imprint of this person, this individual, whom was created out of causes and conditions surrounding them, has gone. But the causes and conditions that were surrounding them are still there. And you and the other friends, loved ones, family members, whom are part of those causes and conditions that help create that Sakaya Ditti, that personality of you in that person, remain. Remain affected or unaffected, positively or negatively, by the actions of that individual. Now that's not to say you take on any of the responsibility of that individual's accident, uh, actions, but you are receiving the benefit of your existence with that person and they continue in, if you like, in there with the remaining society until each and every one of those members of association with that now dead individual, they also die one by one, leaving another space. Now what are we all? We are space. We are space that come from the elements, the earth or solid elements, water, liquid, liquid elements, wind, if you like, air, gases, uh, gaseous elements, and the temperature, our hot bodies, um, generating heat, fire, so ferrous, if you like, element, burning, burning. And a lot of the desire in our actual being, in our uh, craving, in our wanting, which is something I was talking about in the recent video, is from this fuel, this temperature, and very much evident in our temperature. It's very much a, the energy of our existence, if you like, is based on heat. And it is the cooling of this heat that calms and creates uh, the, the peace and calm in our nature that we're always trying to find and what we're looking for but missing because we're going outward looking for it rather than seeing what is already there within us. But then in Buddhism we have an extra couple of elements. We have space which is different from air. It is actually, because air is molecules moving about in wind, it's movement, it's gas, if you like. But space is nothing. But there is really, what is nothing? It is something we can't easily visualize. But it is essentially what is in between those tennis balls. All of these molecules are floating around in space. Without space, we cannot exist. Solidity needs to be in something it's then that we have what knows. Now this is the closest you could how way to describe it to believers would be to say it's like your soul. But if you take your soul and strip it of personality and just take it with the knowing aspect, so it's no longer this particular sex, job, country, person. It is just something that knows. So look at it this way. When you're happy, you know you're happy. When you're sad, you know you're sad. But what is it that knows you're happy? I is it happy? No. And what is it that knows you're sad? Is it sad? No. Similarly, with pain and pleasure, what knows those experiences isn't experiencing but only knowing. And therefore it's 
situation of causes and conditionality isn't going to affect it either. It can only be awareness, consciousness in awareness, consciously aware of what's going on. This in Buddhism is what is unable to die until it is free from attachment in which case it attains to this ultimately ultimate cooling, cooling down of no temperature, ultimate spaciousness, conscious awareness in spaciousness. Now this can be experienced right in this very lifetime in deep samadhi, in the jhanas, in the fourth of the rupa jhanas can be experienced even momentarily. A full immersion of conscious awareness in spaciousness. But not to go into that now, if you think of your loved ones as having only the physical body gone, and often of course you do, and this soul has gone away to heaven or hell, not to ever be seen again, and you'll meet up with them later. In fact, actually, that hasn't gone. You can continue to believe that, and that's good also, that's fine, if it's comforting. Whatever helps to get you through these stages of grief. But the other inevitability and certainty that there is, is that also grief, however many stages, whether it's seven or nine, is a Nietzsche, it is impermanent. You will always love the missing individual who has died. You will always feel sad at the loss. But there will come a time whereas this is going to be less debilitating, less affecting. At the moment, if you've just lost someone, you will feel like there's nothing more you can do. You have no incentive, everything has... you have died with them, almost. And of course that is an understandable and usual feeling. And maybe it doesn't even come immediately. I think there's a couple of these stages before that. How do we deal with that? Now this is an emotion, remember. Grief is another emotion like happiness or sadness. So there is in you something that knows that you are experiencing grief. And that which knows isn't it can be wise and it can know, okay, you're experiencing grief. I, this bunch of molecules which will also die, is experiencing grief. Where is it? Ask yourself that question. Now I don't mean that in some mystical fashion. Physically, how are you feeling grief? Well, I can tell you, it will be somewhere between your solar plexus here and your this bit where they stick a pen if you can't breathe, uh, up the top here. Um, the um, feeling of grief is a, li a little bit like very deep, and it's different to anxiety, but it's almost like a, a truck has hit you, I suppose, boom, like that in there, when you first hear some bad news like that. But it's a then with grief a continuing physical feeling in your body. It's not just an emotion. Now, if you can bring that conscious awareness to that physical feeling in your body, I'm sorry if I'm banging the microphone when I do that. Um, bringing your conscious awareness into that physical feeling in your body actually diverts the mind a little bit away from the mental emotions associated with the grief at that moment. And then just breathe, really breathe deeply into it it's in a good place, this physical aspect of the grief. It may be down into your, your tummy as well, down into your, uh, what's this part, abdomen. But for now, concentrate, of it in your, concentrate on it in your chest and breathe in deeply. And out, as, as if you are really breathing in life. and then letting go of life as you breathe out. Not your conscious awareness. This is very alive. 
as is your friend, your loved one, or your family member in their conscious awareness, their citta, we call it. Breathing in that life, that replenishing, revitalizing air that our physical bodies need. But letting go of that attachment we have to what is, after all, just this bag of skin, bones, and yucky liquids and organs and things. Letting go of that, slowly reducing that attachment to the physical aspect. And also understanding that what are you? What is your personality? And what was that person in their life? Now some people are always the same, but of course they were never the same as a child or a adolescent or a young person or a grown-up or older person, they would have had different educational stages, work stages, different careers, different relationships. And in each of those stages through life, personality-wise, they are different people. I mean, I've had, I'm a very different person now to what I was before I was a monk in a very obvious way. Why? Because becoming a monk, you renounce your former life which is a way of practicing letting go. It is like dying. I think if you spoke to my mother, she might say, well, he's, he's died really. <laughs> that sounds like a horrible thing to say. But, because uh, I'm not the Dan that, I'm now Pradan, yes. Um, or even more detached from that, I'm Bhante Dharma Rakita Bhikkhu, you know, who's that? At least in Thailand, I'm Pradan, I'm Dan again. She'll be happy about that. But he's not the Dan I knew. You know, the Dan who was running around, doing crazy business things, going on holidays, buying houses here, there, and going to the pub and meeting us down at the restaurant. And where's that Dan gone? <laughs> he's still there, yes? Okay, in her memories, which are somewhat unreliable. But he's still, I am still the victim of my own karma those causes and conditions I created for myself back in those days. And probably as a result, I have a long time, maybe many lifetimes in these robes, practicing in this renunciant lifestyle to, let's say, produce enough good karma to balance the books. But did I die? No, I'm still here physically, but actually, she did lose, my mother, the personality. It did die. Whereas in ordinary circumstances, what happens, ordination as a monk aside, people just die as that personality there and then, both physically and personality-wise. But they don't. It is just the physical side. In order for the personality side to die, really, the whole the causes and conditions have to be taken away and radically changed. And the only thing that can kill that of is ordination as a monk or a nun. So if your loved ones died, you could say, think yourself lucky they didn't become a monk or a nun. And I'm not being flippant saying that. I'm trying to explain the point. The point is we are attached to these very superficial, artificial, false impressions that are not there. The closeness you had, have still, with the loved one, even pets, all beings we're talking about. Death affects all beings. That closeness is still there. Knowing that, because what isn't impermanent is Nibbana, the deathless it is called, because there comes a time when we can be fully liberated, having fully let go and freed ourselves from the fetters, the ties to this life 
and rebirth in future lives, however many countless number of attempts that may be, there can be total liberation from that rebirth into that pure conscious awareness in spaciousness which can be experienced through this practice of meditation and will come about with work on that practice with the keeping of moral virtue the practice of meditation and the development of wholesome mind states to understand this nature of these faculties of existence of impermanence of unsatisfactoriness and of the very fact that we have no control over what these bodies will do next I breathe in I breathe out that's as far as we can know you can I said in an airport in a video recently that something like that that when we travel we leave everything as if we're never to return our kuti we clear it out we clean it we we leave it as if we're never coming back or we may die and this is because we may we have come to terms with that we have no certainty of life just the certainty of death I was getting on a plane and I said I could get on this plane it might crash and I won't get to the other side and I was going to Thailand six months previously I was flying to Nepal from the same airport and just recently there's been a terrible tragedy of a plane crash flying to Nepal reverse those situations it may have come that I didn't get to Nepal and I could have died you see this is just an example death is happening all of the time all beings countless beings are dying all of the time but we go on so when you're experiencing grief you bring your attention your conscious awareness to the physical nature of it it's a little bit like dealing with anxiety find it in your body and just watch it know how it's feeling and it won't be very long before as a result of bringing your attention your conscious awareness to the physical feeling in this area of your body or wherever it may manifest itself but I think it's usually around here then your emotional side to the grief will slightly reduce and gradually you can speed up the pr process of You can speed up the grieving process. I suppose the grieving process, as they call it, is a way of um, describing uh, uh, a kind of. If you think of it like this, I suppose you first have shock, and you get, then you get upset, and then you have realization, and then you're going to miss the person. But then, very slowly, as time goes on, gradually, 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 the the sadness the lamentation, depression, all of the horrible associations one must have with uh, being separated from what you love, as will those who will become separated from you one day will have, over time that feeling reduces. But it doesn't go away. But over time what also happens, it's replaced with the good memories. But before waiting for the good memories to come, which after all are unreliable, know that this person experienced both good and bad in their lives, but concentrate on the good. And if you were in association with them, part of that good was as a result of your contribution to their causes and conditions, which made them what they were. So they are a part of you. You are a part of them, and we're all a part of each other in that respect, in our interpersonal rea um, relations. So, <clears throat> what did I want to say more about grief? I might leave it there, and if I think of something else, include it 
in a future video. But for now, I know we all react and experience things differently. Some people are of emotional types, some people are of stoic, a stoic nature. But actually whatever you see outwardly isn't necessarily what's going on inside. So some people may be suffering in silence and some people may not be suffering so much but making a, quite a song and dance about it. You, you know how that is. But this is where universal compassion comes in. We will all experience grief. So we should have universal compassion for all that are experiencing that emotion and be at hand to, on hand to help but not to try and prevent. You can't stop these feelings. Let them go. Don't be the wailing woman in Nepal for three days, but don't be the stoic businessman in a dark suit with a stiff upper lip. The Buddha's teachings were always the middle path, the middle way. It's a matter of understanding. But the first thing to always understand is that death is a certainty. As I started this little talk, uh, the one sure thing we have is that we will die. We were born to die. Everything in between is in the space of what we may call eternity, but in the space of just even this physical universe is a very, very short moment. Now, it's still in your memory and also in your associations, even if you have no memory of an individual so much, if you've only met them for a short time, there is residual karmic consequences always there because we've shared the same space, these molecules, these tennis balls, these subatomic aspects of floating around are sharing the same space even though they are somehow attracted and holding themselves together. This hand is made of molecules, this hand is made of molecules, they're separate like this. But as much as you are separate from me and I am as separate from you, we're all part and parcel of this same molecular universe and even when someone dies and their physical body is either buried or burned in the Christian funerals they say ashes to ashes dust to dust that's quite right you know we come from the earth through eating and feeding ourselves we make these bodies out of the solid elements which change every seven years molecularly cellularly and then we die and it becomes ashes and dust again but you know, that person's impression on you and in this life hasn't died. It's always with you. It is deathless. Now it's only their privileged knowledge after that that really knows what happens. There's no need for us to speculate because the inevitability is we will know at some point in the future. That is also a certainty. But if we can think what it looks like, a way to, a way I heard to, to describe what maybe it looks like from the other side, and this isn't coming from near-death experiences, this is coming from an imaginary idea. But what are we looking out on <clears throat> in the world that we see? amongst all these causes and conditions that create this personality through our eyes is so much. But what is behind our eyes? What is knowing? What is looking? Can you look? Even if you close your eyes, can you look? Can you see behind your eyes? Can you even see your face? 
No. We're always looking out, bringing things in. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. But we're ignoring all that's inside. That knowing aspect, that conscious awareness, the cheetah. Where is it? Is it behind your eyes? Is it in there? Is it in your head? Is it up there? Only through the practice of meditation can you experience, maybe just for a finger snap, that something like what that is, where it is, and how it feels. And that is a possibility. And the Buddha did teach us that, and how, through his methods of meditation. So one reason to keep watching these videos is to learn more about the practice of meditation, which will come when I start to talk about that more, and start practicing meditation yourself. If you're going through the grieving process, it may seem difficult, but it's quite a good time to start. Not formally sitting, necessarily, but just watching the breath and bringing your attention to those physical feelings of grief and has how they are. Maybe just even noting how they are in your mind. And then also noticing with time how they change and slowly reduce. And by being aware of that change and their slow reduction, it will speed up the process. But remember, it's okay to grieve, but it's also okay to speed up the process of getting over grief or reducing the effects of grief. Because that isn't forgetting the dear person that has died. It is enabling you to remember them better in the causes and conditions that remain with you that produced them. Maybe two very different personalities but resulting from the same causes and conditions physically and personality wise. So I should leave it there because I think I've spoken maybe already for too long and until the next video if I'm still around to make one. Maybe I get bitten by a snake. There's lots of snakes here. Um, and I think here is a better place to get bitten by a snake than where I was before. Because where I was before, I don't know what would happen. You'd just die. But where I am now, I think it's within a hundred yards, there's another monk. And I'm sure that it could get me. I've been in this town, I've been to the hospital before. I cut my head open once. And uh, a few years ago now and uh, they got me to the hospital albeit on the back of a scooter but they got me to the hospital quite quickly um, so it's a it's a better place a safer place from that point of view which is causes and conditions brought about I'm not sure exactly how but I, I don't question I can only think I was doing the right thing because it seems like a good uh, result but those causes and conditions now mean I can talk to you a little bit more from a more comfortable environment with a little bit more time. And if you have the questions and the comments you wish to make, I can hopefully continue to have the time to deal with them. And we can help each other in that respect. As fellow beings in this universe, as fellow bunches of molecules or tennis balls all floating around having a whale of a time and essentially not for eternity but for as long as we are fortunate enough if we see it that way to be around or as long as we choose let's see how it goes Namo Buddha